Yeah, You're thanks very much, um, Noel. So um, we're just going to have a short uh, panel discussion. Um, it's more of a conversational style piece with industry pioneers. So I'm delighted to welcome on stage um, James Cogan um, from Clan Bio Group um, and also Daniel Hayes from the Salignus uh, Analytics uh, founder and CEO. So thanks, gentlemen, for joining me. Um, James, uh, Mark was supposed to attend today, but maybe if you want to um, let us know, just he couldn't actually make it uh, for... Uh, yeah, reasons. apologies, uh, Sean, and to Irbe and everybody here. So my boss, Mark Turley, was supposed to be here. He's the founder of the company I work for. And uh, he phoned me on his WhatsApp video from his bed last night saying that he couldn't come because of his, uh, some kind of bug. His wife is actually in a hospital in a drip with the same one. His kids are on it. So he was... Uh, Anyway, he's mortified. I'm very uh, sorry not to be here, and uh, he'd been looking forward to it and preparing for it for a good few days, so sorry very about good. that. Well, thanks, James, for stepping in, and we thought it was very important that we tell the Clan Bio Group story, and James, you're well able to articulate the story on, on Mark's behalf, so maybe if you want to tell us that story, where did the business start, company start, why did you choose Hungary as your first uh, location? All right, so Mark Turley is uh, in his 50s now, he founded Ratdown Motors when he was 18 in Ternure, and then about a dozen years later he went into real estate in Poland and then got out of that and in the, about 2008 went into renewable energy, having done a kind of a scouting of all the various kinds of renewable energy opportunities that there were, and he picked upon ethanol as a substitute for petrol, as a renewable substitute for petrol, and um, built a large plant in Hungary. The idea was to be the kind of like the Ryanair of the ethanol sector, so build the largest, lowest cost uh, uh, ethanol production capacity in Europe. Uh, Hungary is the corn basket of Europe. It's very good logistics. So, uh, there are hundreds of um, foreign direct investment companies there producing stuff, so it was a good place to be. And I know that uh, um, a number of us would have attended Hungary over the years, re most recently a group um, in the last couple of months. Um, it's very clear from visiting Hungary, because I was out there, that your company now is focused on a complementary role between plant-based protein and biofuel production. So can you must tell us more about this? And maybe you, it can be used as a way of dispelling some of the argument about this food versus fuel discussion and debate, which happens a lot with regard to the liquid biofuel sector particularly. Yeah. Well, so that is vital. So we're known as a renewable fuel company now, ethanol and biomethane, uh, but we'd expect that in another two, three, four years we'll be known primarily as a plant protein company because what you don't use to produce the uh, renewable ethanol uh, is protein, oil and fibre. And so we've been in the protein and oil fibre feed business for a dozen years now. And so we've learnt about it and we've pr we're producing more um, specialty and diverse uh, products in those areas. And we're moving into human food. And uh, the logic was, has traditionally been that uh, plant protein is produced from peas and beans uh, and that you get a certain yield per hectare. We're in the grain processing business and the yield per hectare of protein is the same as peas and beans. But the, uh, in addition, then you get a whole load of oil, starch and fiber as well, which we see as also very valuable things. So we're, we've just moved hugely, we've pivoted hugely. It's not we're, we're not leaving what we're doing, but we're, we've added on a new part to the company, which is as big as our original part, which is barley processing, with the primary aim of uh, isolating the barley protein from the barley we're getting higher yields per hectare than uh, traditional peas or beans, so we're making full kind of food use of the land, food, agri-food use of the land. But then uh, we get a load of fibre and starch and sugar from that as well, which we can put back into our ethanol kind of a production and biomethane production. And from there we produce kind of biomethanes, both for energy and chemicals, and bioethanol for energy and chemicals. It's a very good example of the circular economy working very effectively and full use and of, the, of the available uh, feedstock. Obviously regulation is very important in terms of as a key driver for biorefining investment. Can you outline what experiences you have had at both an EU and an Irish level with regard to regulation? Right, well, I, yeah, we're, we're in highly regulated businesses and we're in markets that wouldn't exist if there weren't regulations creating markets for renewable energy. So the company was founded 100% based on their renewable energy directive and specifically the renewable energy for the transport sector. 
Um, and the idea was to become 10 times bigger than our original project size. Uh, and at the time we were developing the project uh, with the 2008, which is the first revision or ED about to be, uh, become applicable, there were, about, there were hundreds of projects like ours floating around Europe. There were business plans all over the place. There were 40 alone in Hungary where we are. Um, we were the only one of those hundreds to get built. Uh, we realized very soon afterwards why nobody else built it, because the, the regulation wasn't solid at all. It was a, a moving sand piece of, of regulation, and the sentiment behind it wasn't positive at all. So even though we'd gone to Brussels and said, are we good to go and invest hundreds of millions by build these plants, and they, were, they said yes, that didn't turn out to be true. And within, uh, within a very short time after ORED1 was uh, implemented, there was a revision out that uh, brought about the, uh, the crop cap, so reducing the amount of the 10% energy to 7% that could be crop, uh, with uh, lower values in different countries, depending, uh, according to the, you know, at the discretion company. So there was a, a kind of a campaign, which we saw as funded by the European Commission and DG Energy against crops, regardless of the sustainability or otherwise of them, and regardless of the fact that we're producing as much protein as we're producing energy, we're substituting soy meal protein imports from the Americas, where we haven't, our, our consumption of grain hasn't increased land use at all in Europe, if anything it's done the opposite, because the farmers around our plant have higher yields than they did when we first came in. So none of that science taken into place, there was a purely emotional kind of NGO driven campaign largely funded by the Commission against us. So it was awful and we didn't build out the other plants other than maximizing the throughput in the plant we are on. And that's kind of conditioned um, our uh, move towards plant protein. The, the, it's not just about us having had a bad time of it um, a half a dozen years ago. It's still the case, the legislation is terrible. So um, Eamon Ryan and a couple of other people uh, referred to the notion of the possibility of there being fraud in the system. So all of the renewable energy that comes into the liquid and gas renewable fuel system in Europe, and that includes Ireland, is certified according to EU, EU certification system. And if it's supposed to be made from a waste oil or whatever it is, it could be from ours as well, it's all uh, certified according to the same EU system, which is a, you know, held up to be a fantastic system. Um, uh, Europe, and Ireland in particular, but Europe has gone from you know, a negligible amount of used cooking oil biofuel in the system to probably 5 million tonnes this year, uh, which is a third of the biodiesel in the system, and rising like that, like it is absolutely skyrocketing. Uh, there, the, that's all perfectly, so, uh, that, that is all certified under the, under the EU system, including all the stuff that's sold into Ireland and that's growing so quickly in Ireland in the HVO sector in particular. Uh, but that EU certification system is useless. So, and the reason it's useless is that if you take it at its simplest, you can buy a ton of palm oil for 600 euros, 650. You can buy, to, to buy a ton of used cooking oil, it costs 20 or 30% more. You could buy, you could go to Kuala Lumpur and you could buy in a ton of uh, palm oil at 650 euros move it to the back of your restaurant and sell it instantly for 20 or 30 percent more. The, the margin difference then on the processed biofuel, so the biodiesel of each year, is even higher. So it's 50 to 100 percent. You can nearly double your money. And that all comes in certified according to the Brussels DG Energy Certification System. And nobody's checking whether those certs are true or not. Combine the fact that the certification system is useless, the opportunity is there because we've just talked about the profit opportunity of shipping the stuff through the restaurant and, and selling it instantly. Uh, though it's not quite like that. They can do it at the collection hubs already and they can do it at the big depots in, in, in uh, the big trading hubs around the world. Uh, the second thing is you can see it in the data. The amount of used cooking oil that's gonna be consumed in European transport this year will be double the, the plausible world collection potential of used cooking oil. And it's not just used cooking oil, um, palm oil mill waste, the amount c consumed in, our, in Europe this year will be double the palm oil mill waste that could possibly be collected in the world. Um, but even in our sector, we make ethanol. Uh, we're not immune to the problem. There's ethanol made from so-called starch waste, waste starch. There's lots of uh, uh, waste starch that we know not to be waste. So the whole thing needs to be policed. Um, I'll just finish on this no very quickly. James, yeah. The problem with it is the scale of it has now distorted the whole market so that the prices and the volumes are determined by the fraud and not by circular economy economics. 
So the people like College Proteins are here today, Green Biofuels, Ireland from New Ross, they're competing against a product that has a massive unfair advantage, which is the ability to take in palm oil through the back door. And that means they can't make a profit, they can't invest in better technology, in higher collection rates locally. Collection rates in Europe haven't, of used cooking oil haven't risen in the last uh, five, eight years. Go figure. DG Energy has never looked at it, refuses to look at it. The certification scheme, which is ISCCC, doesn't do anything about it. They have all the number, they can see this. Why are we pointing it out? And they shouldn't be running. And then the problem is member states, and Ireland is, uh, is probably the biggest um, uh, villain in this, instead of pushing back, actually makes, puts all of these weaknesses at the center of its renewable energy thing. And we have to stop it. We have to stop it because of the damage being done to forests in Indonesia and Malaysia. We have to stop it because of the damage being done to companies like us and the other people in the room who've been uh, working extremely hard and putting their own life into the business and they can't do it. Biomethane in Ireland is, is um, also, you know, a big kind of been sacrificed on the altar of this weak system in Europe. And uh, James is chair of the transport group. We have some very interesting discussions within that group, the RBA members within that group. So I guess we'll be following up on all of that in the coming weeks and months. But just to get back in terms of Clan Bio, can you outline any plan developments in Ireland in terms of the business? Um, have you, um, is there anything you know, that you yeah. might be working on or uh, in terms of plant protein or indeed bioenergy? So um, uh, biomethane is a big part of our expansion plans and we've got a you know, dozen projects around the world now. Uh, we're building a plant in the US that's as big as the one we have in Hungary, which is already huge. It's 44 hectares of densely packed um, uh, processing equipment. Uh, the, because we're, we've moved big into barley away from maize, that puts Ireland back on the map of a kind of place that we could operate on scale. And it, because Ireland has a barley tradition, uh, Ireland also has a kind of a public um, ambition to, multi, uh, to grow tenfold the amount of tillage area producing, you know, tillage crops and not to get dedicated solely to meat and dairy. And we have an amazing agri-food uh, sector, you know, with a, a huge number of ingredients and agri-food products that have been developed and marketed by really successful companies in Ireland. So that puts it all into, and we're an Irish company with massive loyalty to Ireland, even though most of our footprint is outside of Ireland. But our owners are all Irish, they all live here, all their children live here, and there's a kind of a, you know, there's always this emotional draw towards trying to do things in Ireland, and we look at lots of projects every year. So we could do that. Why not is because, as well as the protein, so even if we were buying barley from Irish farmers, we could do a couple hundred thousand tons, uh, and we would have a meat substitute barley, we'd be able to diversify away from the meat and the dairy, make good use of land and all of that kind of things. We also need to be able to do something with the biomethane and the starch that comes out of the plant and to make it all viable. And we need a country that likes biomethane and it likes ethanol. And Ireland doesn't like those things. I mean, I cannot go to our board and say, let's look at it, do a serious project in Ireland. They will say, I'm not going to a country that doesn't like the basic products we do and won't even take the time to think about it. Well, it's food for thought for everyone here because there certainly is opportunities from what you're saying um, and biorefining is talked about a lot in terms of the whole bioeconomy strategy and the development of the bioeconomy in Ireland but I think those challenges which you have outlined are key. Um, and we, want, key we want to make that into a positive so um, I'm in with the Department of Agriculture uh, in quite close talks with them, Department of Enterprise, Enterprise Ireland and with a number of the big agri-food processors in Ireland who would be, you know, really, they'd be able to do this stuff in their sleep. Um, so it's, okay. I hope it turns into a positive story very soon. Well, we hope it does too, and we wish you the best, and we also wish Mark the best in a speedy recovery from his illness, and thanks, James, for Thank you. deputizing. So just show your appreciation for James. You. Daniel, um, conscious of time, um, we we'll give you the same opportunity, maybe to tell us about your business, your story, uh, how you started out, and um, how you've built your business to where it is today. And you have a trade stand here as well, which yes. I'm sure people can find out more as well. But tell yeah. us your story. Yeah, thanks, Sean. So it's basically a series of accidents and unforeseen events that led to where I am now. I, I came to the University of Limerick many years ago now to do a one-year master's. Uh, I was looking at doing a desk-based study to determine the potential for producing advanced biofuels in Ireland. So advanced biofuels would be considered to be the type that you make from 
low-value biomass resources like straw, wood, waste materials, things like that, rather than food crops or oil crops. And I started doing that, and I realized the data wasn't there. Um, so I managed to transfer the, the masters to a PhD. And in that PhD, I uh, outlined a protocol to collect and analyze all the different feedstocks that there are in Ireland to try and make this projection more realistic. And to do that, I had to build up the laboratory within the university because they didn't have any of the equipment that we needed. Uh, I set up uh, a, the research group called Carbolia at the University of Limerick to do this. And over a couple of years, that progressed quite well. I got a couple of grants from various institutions in Ireland, like uh, Department of Agriculture, EPA, and so forth. And then got quite a large grant uh, from the European Union for a collaborative research project that the University of Limerick coordinated. Um, that started around 2009. I wrote it while I was still doing the PhD. Um, we had lots of big aims and ambitions. One of them was we would eliminate diesel imports in Europe by 2020, which we didn't quite do. <laughs> but um, one of the other ambitions, one of the targets was related to my actual PhD work, which was I spent so much time developing the lab and developing the protocols for analysis. These take a long time. Each sample can take two weeks worth of work. So the PhD was focused on using near infrared spectroscopy as a rapid tool to predict uh, the composition. And you can reduce that time from two weeks to 20 seconds. Um, so this was also part of that European project. And one of the deliverables, because you have to write a thing at the end of the project to, to show how you performed, was that um, we would patent these NIR models. And I found out you can't actually, it's very difficult to patent algorithms. So we changed the deliverable to uh, write a business plan for a theoretical company that would commercialize these models. So I wrote that plan to fulfill a requirement of the project. Um, but after writing it, I thought maybe there's actually a, a space here because no one's doing this thing. No one had these models else in the world. No one still has the models, actually. And there's no company in the world, then or now, focused as we are on the, the bioeconomy primarily from biomass and biomass and waste. So that's how we started. We've changed okay. a lot since then. But, and yeah. practically, what do you do, I suppose, that might be relevant to a lot of our attendees today that are feedstock suppliers or using a technology or trying to produce energy from a, a crop or a waste. So how so, could you help them? What do you do? So we, we, we do two types of things, basically. So we do analysis, the first thing. And we have two sites now in Limerick. One is an analytical lab, and the other one I'll mention shortly. Um, in the analytical lab, we focus on whatever properties are relevant to your targeted application. So if it's bioenergy, we've got a, um, a whole range of equipment for determining the calorific value and all the kinds of parameters associated with um, thermal decomposition of biomass, slagging, sintering, and all those problems that you might have. Uh, if it's biogas, we have a whole array of equipment from the, the one liter scale to the 20 liter scale to evaluate feedstocks, evaluate process conditions, and how things can be optimized. Uh, we're doing all kinds of work with seaweed and other types of biomass feedstocks. Biochar has been a big thing that we're looking at at the moment that's growing quite a lot. Um, we can produce the biochar or we can take the biochar. We can analyze it and see uh, what kind of application potential it has or maybe how it can be improved so that the value can be uh, further increased in okay. different markets. And just, just one other thing. So the, the other side that we do is the bioprocess side. So we have all this analytical expertise, but, w but within the team, uh, we also understand what that means in terms of biomass processing and valorization. So we're able to help clients that are looking to develop a process from scratch or to optimize a process, we work with them through that process to, to get the best output for them. So this can be in the form of lab scale optimizations that scale all the way up to uh, currently 100 liter level. And within the next year, we'll be scaling that to a cubic meter level where people okay. can do various types of uh, processing. Okay. And um, can you just outline to us the importance of analysis? Because obviously information is an and technical information is crucial to decision making. For instance, if you're building a biomethane plant, you need to know the methane perc um, percentage of your feedstocks. Um, so, yeah. so I mean, can you yeah, yeah, put a value on analytics for us? Well, it's, it's, it's crucial, and, and particularly the process that you're looking at, you can have all kinds of different streams coming out. So if you take what James is doing, for example, he has this, this wonderful... I, I was just going to butt in and say we work with them and we couldn't work without 
companies like Zelignus and Zelignus in, in particular. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so for example, what James is doing is, is really looking to optimize the full feedstock. And you, you, yeah. you take a start and you can divert into different fractions, some of them solid, some of them liquid. And you want to get a full mass closure at each different stage so you can see how well you're valorizing that initial substrate and to maximize the, the revenue for the facility. Okay. And in terms of future, what's the future for your business? And maybe also in terms of future technology advancement, um, are there any things that you're working on that will potentially assist bioenergy into the future? So we're looking very much to develop the bioprocess side of the company. So we're looking to. So we, we got another site in Limerick for that, um, and we're going to scale that up in the next year to processing, as I mentioned, one cubic meter vessels, and that will really help people um, within Ireland and o overseas to uh, cost effectively improve their processes. You might be running an AD plant now, and you want to try something out, but you try something out at that scale, it's going to end in, in tears because the, the, the system's going to crash. So you do it at the lab scale, you, you iteratively scale that up, and you get to a, a steady state system within a sort of our pilot level that you can then transfer to the, the demo facility. And, and one other aspect that we're looking at as well on the analytics would be the use of the near infrared spectroscopy. I haven't forgotten entirely about that, so it's still... Um, what was a hindrance uh, until now was the cost of the equipment, but there's been some advances recently that allow this equipment to, to have gone down in price from, let's say, 120,000 to about 8,000 euros per yeah. item. And what we're doing, we've done this in an EU project, and we're, we're looking to do this with clients next year, is we develop bespoke models for their process so they could rapidly see uh, not just what's going in, but all the different streams, and they can make informed decisions very quickly. Okay. And a final question, because I'm conscious of time, and we're just about to finish up this segment. What are the opportunities and, and areas of maybe concern for you? James has highlighted them from his perspective and Clown Bio Group perspective. Have you similar concerns or with regarding policy, regulation, and then I suppose linked with that, have you any take-home messages for attendees today? Take-home message, I would say, um, don't wait for the government to cop on. It's, it's like waiting for a girl to ask you out. It's, it's not <laughs> going to happen. Um, I, I would say, like, again, I'd go back to what James is doing. So, so you, um, and it is something that we're looking at ourselves with the biomass and the, the technologies we're developing. So, for example, we're looking at a certain aspect of using um, the hemicellulose fraction to make materials that could be of high value application to replace synthetic plastics, for example. Now, when you talk about biofuels, there's government subsidies. When you talk about bio-based products, there's no government subsidies. So one argument would be, oh, we can't do it because the government's not going to support us, you know? But the alternative then is you look at that particular niche where you can inject yourself, where you can make the highest value product. It doesn't have to be the highest volume product, but it can get you to the point where you're crossing that valley of death without having to rely on others to get you forward. Um, so that's one thing. I know it's very difficult in, in bioenergy to do that because bioenergy is a, a commodity that is traded. You know, you're, you're a kilowatt hour versus wind or whatever else. Um, so for that side, I, I would um, defer to the expertise of, of my colleagues like Lelita and others that are present today to say that, um, again, a, even an AD facility is, is in itself a biorefinery and you have different streams and substrates and residues and, and opportunities. And, and we're, looking, um, we're working with different clients in Ireland and around the world on how um, those different streams can be valorized and the whole techno-economic viability of the whole process can be made worthwhile without having to go begging to the government and just crying. So, yeah. Well, look, uh, on that, um, I thank you very much. I wish you continued success. Likewise, I wish the Clan Bio Group continued success in your endeavours too. And I'm sure if there's anyone that would like to talk to you further about how they could optimise their process, uh, you have your stand here and it's easy to get in touch with you as well. Sure. So um, thanks very much, Daniel, and thanks, James. And um, I'll hand back to Noel, who's going to give the final segment before lunch. Um, so thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.